Okay, so tonight we got, uh, I want to talk about abolishing legalism. So let's define our terms. What is legalism? Simple definition. Your personal definition. Okay, personal preferences. What else? Legalism. So that could be, so preferences. Preferences over. Deb. Deb Peraska's yeah. uncle. Uncle, he passed away last Friday. Oh, yes. Remember Deb Peraska's uh, uncle in uh, bereavement. Okay, legalism. What is legalism, Jody? I think it's taking scripture out of context. Okay, taking scripture out of context. Okay, so we could define legalism as taking the rules and regulations of God to a point to where they actually don't apply. Now, think about some legalistic things, because we're going to go through a few, and maybe uh, these apply to what you're going to think about, and, and we'll go over them. Jeff. Jeff. Okay, that is perfect because salvation is first and foremost. And what happens is, in Galatians chapter 1, verse 8 and 9, what does Paul say? I'll just leave that there for later when I'm done. Galatians 1, 8 and 9, anybody know? Come on, off the top of your head. So if uh, we or an angel from heaven give you any other gospel than what I've given to you, let them be damned to hellfire. Uh, I said it before and I'll say it again. If we come to you with any other gospel than what we preached, let them be damned to hell. Uh, literally, it's Maranatha. It comes from the Greek, which means to judgment, given to judgment. And that's, that's what that means. So I'm kind of using a little bit of liberty, but uh, I'm forcing that. You don't add to the gospel. The gospel is your faith and trust in Christ alone apart from any works. But what happens is, and this is where legalism comes in. Legalism says it's faith in Jesus Christ plus you have to do this. And that's, and that's what you're talking about. So we have to separate. Now, let me ask you this question because everything we're going to talk about is going to derive around this. What makes you a perfect Christian? Sure. Right there. Positionally speaking, how are you declared righteous? Through Christ. My faith in Jesus Christ makes me declared righteous before the eyes of God. So let me ask you this question. What I do, does that make me any better of a Christian? What I don't do, does that make me any better of a Christian? So, so when we talk about salvation, that's God's love for us, right? Whatever I do for God, is he going to love me more for it? And if I don't do anything for him, is he going to love me less? Okay, now this is where legalism comes in, and this is where we're trying to abolish this stuff. Because what we do in our human mindset is we lift ourselves up with pride and we go, oh, I'm a better Christian than him because I do this. And we measure ourselves up to each other when we should really be measuring ourselves up to Christ, right? I'm declared righteous because of Jesus. You're declared righteous because of Jesus. And that's where Paul says in Galatians 3.28 that we're all the same. We're all one in Christ, right? Why do we create legalistic standards? Now, if you're not going to be legalistic... You might want to understand what the Bible has to say about it 
because it may or may not be legalistic. It may apply to you or it may not. But you have to understand context. Let's get into some of this. Do you have to attend church service every time the doors are open? How many of you old school people were in church every time because mom and dad made you? <laughs> it's old Tom Craft there. When Moby was a minnow, buddy, he was there every time. Mom and dad made him go through there. And people do that. I'm telling you, people do that all the time. Uh, when the doors are open, we're going to be there. Uh, now, some of those testimonies are a little more rare today because, um, in all honesty, church attendance is, generally speaking, declining. Um, but so does a Christian have to attend every service Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday um, that a church provides? And the simple answer is no, right? You say no. It doesn't make me any better of a Christian. Okay, so then why are you complaining about people that aren't here? Well, there's some issues there. That's the simple answer. But is it more to that answer than meets the eye? Okay, yes. They must not want to be here. Don't forsake the assembling together. Where's that found? In the Bible. <laughs> okay. I know it's in there. You know it's in there. One day we're going to start putting it together where you can find it. Um, Old or New Testament. Okay, there you go. We're, narr we're narrowing it down. <laughs> So our relationship with God is not based off of rule following. Does that make sense? And this is what we've done. We have put our relationship with God into following a bunch of rules. Do we follow God's rules because that makes us better Christians? There you go. So, and, and that is everything that separates legalism for true biblical Christianity. Everything that we do is because we love the Lord Jesus, because of what he's done for us. And so what we do or don't do doesn't make us any better of a Christian. This is, and this is, goes back to what Jeff said. Matter of fact, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2, it says, to the church of God that's in Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, who are called to be saints, Sorry, Roman Catholics, you don't have to do all these miraculous works and be verified by all this. Anybody who's in Christ is a saint. That's the word saint. It comes from the Greek word hagios. It means holy. Anybody that's in Christ is holy, right? And there you go. Uh, to be saints together with all of those in every place who call upon the name of the Lord, uh, both their Lord and ours. Anybody that calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You are declared righteous, you are sanctified in Christ, you are holy, and you are a child of God. Boom. We're all the same. Now, eternity, and this is where eternity is only gained by those who truly accept the Lord. That's why Paul says in 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5, test yourself, try yourself, examine yourself. Do you not know that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless you uh, fail to meet the test, unless you're disqualified. Um, uh, King James says, unless you have a reprobate mind. So there is something that will disqualify you. You need to make sure that you're in Christ. Uh, and so there's many tests, and we've gone over a lot of that. However, there is a problem with coming to church uh, or having some nonchalant attitude about church attendance. Like, you simply don't want to come. Why do you not want to come to church? <laughs> Why do you not want to hear the word of God? I, uh, I heard somebody that uh, doesn't come to Wednesday night uh, or, or uh, a lot of Sundays because, uh, th I'm sorry, this was their reply. Listening to the Word of God is boring. Okay. Hey, um, <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know what you want. <laughs> okay, moving on. <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't know what people want us to say, but God's plan from this age to now, the age of the Gentiles, involves the church. And Jesus Christ said to Peter, he promised to build the church, Matthew 16, 18. He said, you are Peter, uh, and upon this rock I will build my church. 
Uh, so he promised to build that, and we should be supporting God's plan enthusiastically. Um, and uh, Jill, while you're writing this, write this down. Hebrews 10, 25, uh, uh, 24 and 25, the writer of Hebrews says, Let us consider how to stir one another to love and to good works, not neglecting or forsaking, King James, not forsaking to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. It's interesting that even in the early church, there were people that didn't want to gather together. We have the same problem today, right? It's the same problem. Listen, Christianity takes work and effort. It takes work and effort. You guys have been to work all day. It takes work and effort to go home, get something to eat, and come back here so that you can listen to the Word of God. It takes work to stay awake. I I get that. Um, (laughs) Man, it takes work to stay awake on Sunday. (laughs) I'm just talking about me because I'm preaching. I put myself to sleep sometimes. But here, here's the idea. You got you to gotta go above and beyond. You have to do something about it. You, your love for the Lord should take away from those things. Um, even though those people that didn't want to meet together, those examples are not to be followed. Uh, the church has spiritual gifts, and you're to use them in the church. And how are you going to use them to edify one another and stir each other up to love and pray for one another if you don't meet together, right? Uh, and, and I know there's some in this church that don't come because they don't believe you have to go to church. Well, I accepted Jesus. That's all I need to do. I'm good to go for life. Well, I hope you accepted Jesus. And that's my point. Because, yes, your church attendance has absolutely nothing to do with your salvation, but it's your heart's attitude. If you have no... Listen, what does Ephesians 5, verse 25 say? Oh, come on, people. It's uh, Paul Paul addressing the marriage. Uh, 22 is talking to women. 25, he starts talking to men, and he says what? And... Gave himself up for it. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave his life for her. Okay, if Jesus Christ gave his life for the church, shouldn't that be something that should be important to us as well? (laughs) If Christ loved the church that much, we should love the church. I mean, so yeah, if you're a new creature in Christ, you have new desires, you have new ideologies, you have all kinds of new things. If you have nothing new and you don't ever have to go to church, you don't ever have to do anything, and you don't ever have to know what your gift is, you don't ever have to do any of that, I would suggest, did you even get saved? Well, you can't tell who's saved and who isn't. That's true. The only one I know for sure is saved is me. But I can say what the Bible says. You better examine yourself. Because Jesus says you can tell a tree by the fruit it bears. And if you have zero fruit, what kind of a tree are you? Because God said that you are going to bear fruit for the kingdom. You will. Whether it's small fruit, big fruit, a lot of fruit, or just a couple. You will bear fruit for the kingdom. Period. It's also a learning experience. You know, when I first got into HVAC, if I took the attitude that some people do about church and never studied, (laughs) I'd be at the same level I am 45 years later. Yeah. Church gives you a reason to study the Bible and you don't know who you're going to be alike to. Sure. You be sitting in that pew and somebody comes in and knows you and says, hey, I know somebody here. You know, for me, I come to church for a break. You know, I love it. The world just... Church should be a place to get away, a safe place to get away from the world yeah. where you can be encouraged, um, get the word of God, uh, pray for one another, encourage one another. This is where you get away from all that stuff. We don't have any political affiliation here. We don't have any problems out here in the world. You don't worry about gas prices when you're sitting in here, do you? Uh, Yeah, you'll worry about it when you walk outside, but not in here. We don't worry about that stuff. We come together in unity, pray for one another, encourage one another, hear the word of God so that we can go out into the junk of the world and keep going. Yes, you put your armor on in that respect. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Uh, so does God care a hell of beans about whether you come to church or not? No, but it's a heart's attitude. Everything we do is out of our love for the Lord Jesus. 
And so, you know, I, I, I told Matt, I said, when you guys go on vacation, and he said, well, we're leaving Monday, and we'll be back Friday, and we'll be here Sunday. So we'll never, and I said, no. I said, you need to take a break. No, I, oh, we can't do, oh, I can't do that. I can't miss church. And I said, well, you have devotions with your family, but you're not showing up that Sunday. Well, no, we're, not, we're not leaving. I said, I don't care whether you're leaving or not. You'll stay home and you'll do devotions with your family, but you're not coming into this place. You need a time to get away. God knows that. I mean, doggone. But that's old school because he grew up like Tom in this old school mindset. And so it's hard to get out of that. When you're ingrained like that, it's hard to get out of that, isn't it? Yes. Because that's who you are. You are who you are from the day you're born until the day you die. Yes. And if you don't watch, guys like me and Matt, that, you know, it was a sin not to be at the church when the church was there. It's hard to see a person that just arbitrarily don't come on Wednesday night. That's right. That's right. It's legalism. It does. Absolutely. And it gets to you. It does. Absolutely. And it's hard to get rid of it because, I'm sorry, go ahead, Greg. That's right. You start getting frustrated yeah. and you lose sight of what it really is about. Sure. Great damage over the generations oh, that's creating that environment. Of, we sure have. I feel guilty instead of saying, well, all right, the grace of God, He loves me. It's well, I gotta go. And then that's right. You see people walking away. That's right. They do. They walk away because of the legalism. Yes. They do. So, so we have like Christmas and Easter. Right. We have like the virgin birth of Jesus, and we have Easter, which is the death, burial, and resurrection. The Jews, even though those are celebrations as well, those are legalistic. You have to perform them at a certain time of a month, a certain time of the year, and, and you can't miss those. And you're like, wow, that okay. That's, yeah, it is. This is what I would say. We are created as human beings to follow rules. And I know that goes against everything that legalism <laughs> that we're trying to abolish. But we were created to follow rules. Children need discipline. Children need instruction. Children need to follow rules. You need to redirect. And so that's what we've done is we've tried to We've tried. It's easier to follow rules and, and put you in this little box, but you've got to be careful because where there's freedom, don't use your freedom as an occasion to the flesh, and don't use your freedom to let somebody stumble. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to create something so that people don't stumble. But what we do then is then legalistically we say, you're a better Christian or you're not a better Christian, and so we go above and beyond. Uh, and so it's kind, of, uh, it's kind of hard to go through some of those things. So no, church attendance, no. It uh, doesn't matter. But it does show you where your heart's attitude is. People love to come. People love to get changed. And so sometimes you'll hear the word of God and it'll change your life. I redirected my life um, years ago uh, with my brother uh, at Community Baptist Bible Church back in the 90s. <laughs> and... It was a message on tithing. Had absolutely nothing to do with the conviction God put on my heart. And he said, you miserable creep. I saved you so many years ago at Cook Road Baptist Church, and you ain't done a daggum thing for me. I died for you. What are you doing for me? And man, it broke me. It broke me. Dude's talking about tithing, and God's breaking me because I'm a miserable creep, and I ain't served him, and... Man, I went forward, man, read that. I was like, Lord, I know you saved me right here at Cook Road Baptist Church, and I haven't done nothing for you since. Man, here I am. What do you want me to do, God? And boom, my growth began to flourish from there. It was amazing. I love that. So yeah, it doesn't matter. if it, Sometimes people can just change by any kind. The Word of God is amazing. It changes lives, and you need to hear it. Jeff. Yeah. I used to avoid that. I, I didn't even I didn't want to acknowledge it just because I didn't I don't think I quite understood 
Yeah. It does. But, and, but, it was, but in a good way. It's a, it's a good verse. And a lot of people get scared of it. Because they're like, well, well, you know, faith is what saves you. That's right. But did you get a change? Do you have a change? Because that'll show it in your works. Absolutely. And it's hard because like some people, they backslide and all that stuff. How do you know if they're not in a backslidden condition? I didn't have any fruit. Matter of fact, you looked at my life, you'd be like, that miserable creep will never be a pastor. <laughs> and I'd be like, man, if you knew the stuff I did back in my day, you'd, you wouldn't have voted for me, I guarantee it. <laughs> but here's the issue, that, that's legalism. It's not about what you do, it's about who you are. And now you're trying out of your love for Jesus to make your life match your position. And that's a different thing than having a bunch of rules and regulations. What about modest apparel? I'm just going to talk about suit and tie. Here's a good one. Suit and tie. We talk about, I think Susie mentioned suit and tie. We told everybody you had to wear a suit and tie. Why? It honors the Lord. It honors the Lord. Man's tradition. Absolutely. What about a suit and tie honors the Lord? Because I'm going to give you a verse that says the exact opposite. Because that's what was in style. Though. Exactly. Well, it was. A lot, of, a lot of people wore suit and ties. Especially on Sunday, you know the people that just come out of church because they had a suit and tie on. Because most everything back in the day was clothes. <laughs> Some still do. My daughter-in-law's church, you have to dress up and women never wear slacks. Okay. That's legalism in some sense. In our church in Pennsylvania, they felt it was appropriate for the pastor to wear a suit and tie. And they said, we understand that the Bible makes no provision that you have to wear a suit and tie. We think it is, as our church, this is our corporate church. We are the church here at Northridge Baptist Church in Somerset, Pennsylvania. We, we ask that you wear a suit and tie on Sunday morning. And they give me a $500 a year uh, provision for clothing allowance. And they said, we'll give you this, we'll do this. All we ask you wear a suit and tie on Sunday morning by you voluntarily doing that. And I said, if that's what you want, I got no problem with it. It doesn't become legalism if you accept it. But if it's forced on you, that's legalism. And so when you talk about a suit and tie, here's one. This is beautiful. 1 Timothy 2.9. It's talking about the men, and then it goes right into the women. Likewise, also, that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel. King James says, modest apparel. With modesty and self-control, not with braided hair, gold, pearls, or costly attire. That word respectable or modest apparel, do you know what I, I mean? Yes, it does. We, we talk about modest apparel and we go, oh, well, girls' skirts shouldn't be six inches below the knees and you can't show any cleavage because, oh, that's uh, terrible. Uh, and, and there's true. There's, there's biblical principles there. Uh, I only say that because Solomon says in Proverbs, or um, is a proverb? It's either Proverbs or Song of Solomon. I forget which one it is. I'd have to look it up for you if you actually want the verse. But it talks about how God gave men a desire. Men are stimulated by sight. And God gave a desire for men to desire women's breasts. And so the idea is already in there in men. It's already in there naturally. And so if you're going to show... Men have that desire to look. That's why you can't be exposing too much because men are going to look. That's why I, I hate going to the, I'd rather go to the mountains and go to the beach. I mean, me and Emily got this thing, you know, first one forgiven, but <laughs> maybe you're like, look at them and go, oh, man, could have done without that. <laughs> man, that thing is, whew. But, but here's the idea. That word respectable and modest apparel, do you know what that means in the Greek? It does mean, you know, respectable, but it means rich clothing. Rich clothing. Why? Because when rich people come into the church back in the early days of the church, they were shown partiality because they had money. So number one, you don't wear clothing to draw attention to yourself. And number two, don't put on something that's not you to make you look richer than what you are. So now when you look back and you go, oh, everybody has to wear a suit and tie because that's respectable to God. That just makes you look more than what you are. Because in Pennsylvania, we had a lot of farmers. And man, they snored really loud. And that's all I, I'm telling you. One day, it's a true story. You ask Emily. One day, 
I got up at 1.30 in the morning and I went to the farm and I helped milk their cows. And then I went to, Sunday, and I went to church and preached. And I could barely keep my own eyes open. And I said, I have just worked with these guys milking their cows. I can't keep my eyes open, man. And I know that they're snoring. And I'll be doggone if one person's going to say a word. So if you want to go out there and do their job, you go do it and keep your mouth shut if they're starting to snore louder and I'm preaching. But I, I tell you, it was amazing, but about where you out. But they would come faithfully every Sunday because they wanted to hear like the first five words and then they were out. But I appreciate it. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but people don't understand that. It's, it's, don't, don't draw attention to yourself coming into church. Uh, and, and don't look richer than what you are. That's the whole idea. So my favorite... King James only. <laughs> I don't have a problem with the King James only. Um, some churches say you can only preach from the King James. That's fine. Don't care. King James is a good version. I just have to talk a little more because I have to explain all the archaic words that are, that are found in there. Um, who knows what uh, evil concupiscence is? What does it mean to fetch a compass? Pray in your closet, yeah. They're like, what? The biggest thing is, you said it's a virgin. Yes. It is a virgin. Exactly. And that's where people gag and gnat swallow the camel. Yes, because they'll take a virgin and they'll make it an idol. Absolutely. And, then, and, and I know people that say, if, you're not, if you don't have a King James open, you can't get saved. Yeah. Uh, excuse me? If you were saved under an NLV or an ESV, you're not saved. Come on. Yes. So, so here's the beauty. When, who, who is the first gospel written? Who wrote the first gospel? Okay, you only got four. Matthew, Mark, or Luke? Or John? And I'm going to eliminate John because he didn't write his gospel till 80 to 94 B.C., A.D. So it's... it's wasn't Matthew, and it wasn't Luke. <laughs> Who's left? <laughs> Mark. So John Mark wrote the first gospel. Anybody know what year? Right. No, not 30 AD, no. It was somewhere around 56 AD. So it was either from 54 to 62 AD because... So Mark doesn't describe um, the destruction of Jerusalem. And so that was in 70 AD. And... 50 A.D.? Okay. So the Apostle Paul wrote most of the New Testament, and he was the one that began to write it first. So John Mark and Luke, they documented from eyewitnesses. So John Mark was with the Apostle Paul and with Peter. Luke was with the Apostle Paul, and he was with Peter. So both of their accounts are from actual eyewitnesses, and they give different versions of it. So from even 50 A.D., so let's say, and I don't know exactly the year that Jesus died, um, because you remember when Herod sought to kill Jesus and all the babies that were born two years and younger, and he, he had to flee to Egypt? Okay, and then God said, come on back because Herod's dead. Herod died in 6 B.C. So Jesus was probably born around 8 B.C., so when was he crucified? I don't know. It's irrelevant. <laughs> it's 2,000 years ago. So we just know somewhere around 20-some A.D. He, he died. So let's say it's 30 A.D., 50 A.D. What's the difference there between 30 and 50? 20 years. How did people get saved in those 20 years? Well... Well, if the King James was good enough for Paul, it's good enough for us. Well, okay, from the death of Jesus until the Gospels were written 20 years, how did people get saved? The Apostles' Doctrine. What was the Apostles' Doctrine? This was, at, yes, it was Old Testament. This is the importance of creeds. 
You know what a creed is? You ever heard of the uh, um, Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed? It talks about we believe Jesus, blah, 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 blah. Okay, creeds were important in the New Testament times. That's why they continued them on. Um, So everything that was preached was from a creed that was Old Testament. And so that's what Peter preached. That's what Paul preached. So when he preaches that, it's a creed from the Old Testament. And so he quotes it as Scripture. That's where 1 Corinthians 15, uh, the gospel in which you're saved, unless you believed in vain, uh, that Jesus died uh, and was buried according to the Scriptures, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Well, what Scriptures? None of the Gospels were written. <laughs> and so this goes back to the Old Testament. and was based off of creeds. If you want good information on creeds, one of the greatest, absolute greatest apologetic uh, things that we have, Dr. Gary Habermas from Liberty University, he has excellent work on creeds. And it gives, uh, because most of the stuff that we have from people that don't have any of their stuff documented, it's all gone, burned up, or destroyed, are based off of creeds that were created from their accounts. And nobody discredits them. <laughs> so anyway... So that's the idea. You, you have to understand that it's, it's the Word of God that's given. And I don't care if it's in the NIV, NASB, NLT, ESV, King James, New King James, except uh, not the message. That's from the pits of hell. Jeff. Yes. And he said, you accepted it as it were, not the words of men, but as it was the word of God. Yeah. That's it. That's good. Here's my favorite one. How many of you tell you that tattoos are inappropriate? What about piercings? Oh, nobody should get a pierce. How about nose rings? Oh my goodness, nose rings are from the pits of hell. Anybody that has a nose ring, that's terrible. (laughs) You know, it's funny. Abraham's son Isaac, his wife was given a nose ring. Genesis 24, 47. Remember the messenger that he sent? And he said, I want to find somebody, and if she says this, and she, so he found somebody, and she said all that, and he said, well, my, my master's son is looking for a, uh, a wife for him, and says, who are you? And he said, ah, I'm the daughter of Bethuel, Nahor's son, uh, Milka bore to him. So he put a ring in her nose and bracelets on her hands, and that was, uh, that was uh, engagement gifts. Yeah, man, that's awesome. Oh, that's just women stuff. Only women got nose rings. No, if you go to 2 Chronicles, I think 33, verse 10 through something or another, it talks about how men were taken captive as slaves and they were putting nose rings in there and hooked, linked together. Uh, and so that's how they carried them by their nose. They wouldn't, yeah, they wouldn't go nowhere. So yeah, that was as, as punishment, which, you know, whatever. Uh, but yeah, so you got punishment, so you got wedding stuff. Matter of fact, God says this in Ezekiel... I think it's 16, Ezekiel 13 or 16. You have to look that up. But Ezekiel 16, God says, you are my bride and I gave you, as it were, a nose ring and bracelets and gold and silver and you were precious to me. He's using it metaphorically. He didn't actually give him a nose ring. So in the Old Testament, when a slave didn't want to leave his master and all was driven through his ear. Make a big old hole like those people with gauges. I saw some guy in the Guinness Book of Records had the biggest one. It was six and a half inches, man. Big. I'm like, dude, man, that's... <laughs> and, and the old legalistic person in me just wants to go rip that thing right out of there. <laughs> you you got to have grace. You got to have grace. I'm just saying, be graceful. Be graceful. Oh, that's crazy. What about education? How can education be legalistic? You don't want to talk about your tattoos, Susie? I do not want to be a scratch pad for anybody. (laughs) She's so much holier thou than me. She don't have no tattoos. What about education? How can that be legalistic? Is it legalistic? 
Do we? <laughs> yeah. Is the government right about anything? Yeah. Okay. Well, all right. You want to bring up pastor? Should a pastor go to school? And if he should, show me in the Bible where it says a pastor should be educated. Well, if yeah, if you can't read, yeah, that's going to be a problem for a guy. So if you can't read, then Jesus probably isn't going to call you to be a pastor. I would assume. He did. He sure did. Matter of fact, Paul was even educated by Jesus himself. Education. Okay, degrees. To have a fancy degree. That's individually for everyone. Um, actually, it comes from the Greek word, which means uh, to trouble yourself. Uh, New King James said, <laughs> he's so much more holier than me because he knows Greek words, definitions. No, here's the deal. If you take your education and use it over top of somebody, then it's legalistic. Yes. But if you take your education and help the church out, it's not legalistic. Okay, that's great. I'm glad that you said that. Taking your education to put yourself above somebody is legalistic, right. but to take your education to help people um, is far better, and that's what we want to do. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse uh, 1, uh, it's talking about idols, but he says, we all possess knowledge, but knowledge puffeth up. That's King James. New King James says knowledge puffs up. <laughs> ESV says knowledge lifts up. So, let me go through a few more so I can show you my knowledge. But he, here's the point. <laughs> the paraphrase version, yeah. knowledge of make you get a big head. And, but here's, here's the idea. This is, why, this is why you have to take the Bible for what it says. Galatians 3.23 says there's neither Jew nor Gentile, there's neither slave nor free, and there's neither male nor woman. We are all one in Jesus Christ. And the same thing holds true for me. I don't go and say, hey, HVAC guy, come here. So I don't expect people to say, hey, pastor, come here. That's my job. That's not who I am. My name is Dan. Uh, actually, Daniel on my birth certificate. Uh, and so, but it doesn't matter to me whether you call me pastor or Dan or just don't call me late for any kind of food thing or anything like that. But here's the point. This is what aggravates me. So many people get an education, and what's the first thing out of their mouth? You'll address me as doctor. Oh, uh-huh. I'm sorry, doctor. I keep forgetting. Jesus is going to say, well done, thou good and faithful doctor. <laughs> I keep forgetting. I thought we were all servants, but we're not. And so we do. We, we elevate ourselves above by education. And yeah, that shouldn't be. That shouldn't be. What else? Somebody got another one? We've got 10 minutes. I got one I want to finish on. Probably make a lot of people angry, but it's okay. Tithing, that's a good one. Well, and the, yes, that is, that, uh, that's a tithing, that's an issue. Do we have to tithe? <laughs> What's God's? Which one tenth are you talking about? Which one-tenth of the first fruits are you talking about? In the Old Testament, there's nine tithes. Which ones of the first fruits are you talking about? So, and this is, this is the importance of defining those terms and figuring out which is an Old Testament term for Israel and what is for the church. Because when you come to the New Testament, even though Jesus mentions tithes twice, and that's it. So, and that's where he says, you tithe 
uh, of all these spices, <laughs> but you gag it in that and swallow a camel. Uh, you, you omit the weightier matters of the law. And so even though Jesus fulfilled the law, and we are you know, in Christ, and we should fulfill that as well, no New Testament command is there to tithe. So here's the issue. Do we tithe or don't we? And we do that based off of, and, and I'm not going to say anything about a tithe because we have to have a, a, a number. We've got to start somewhere, right? Sure. That's New Testament. That's uh, 1 Corinthians. Right. So God owns it all. You're not going to have to give an account for anything you give. You're only going to have to give an account for what you keep. And it's not about a specific number. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 8, Paul says, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm giving this as a way to test your love for Jesus if you give. If you love Jesus, you'll give. Now what do you do? Now, we take the Old Testament principle... And we say a tithe is a good place to start. Now, I think it would be appropriate if somebody, and most of the people today live paycheck to paycheck. And I would say, don't be a burden on your family. You've got to take care of your own house. But give something to God. And then begin to work to get out of debt. <laughs> there's Dave Ramsey and there's, uh, holy macro. there's so many <laughs> ways that you can help yourself get out of debt. But you have to take a step to, to want to get out of debt. But the problem is when we talk about tithes and offerings in the Old Testament, it was always for the temple. Everything was for the temple to take care of God's house and the priests. And so just like you take care of your home first and then you give everything else above and beyond that after your house is taken care of, the same principle applies to the church. We have to take care of our local assembly first. And then once you have given to that, then above and beyond goes to other stuff. And so we have to train people up to, you can't take care of missionaries in far off countries and not take care of your own assembly. Uh, and some people have done that. And some people may still do that. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm going to say what we say. According to our constitution, by faith and practice, we give to the local church first. Above and beyond that, then we give to uh, missions. And above and beyond that, it's all the other programs. Children's, teens, youth, ladies, men's ministry, whatever. It's not about a specific number. God loves a cheerful giver. But here's the idea. The people that have always stepped out by faith to give have always seen God do a miraculous work in their life. I have never been without. And in this day and age, I praise God um, that I have the ability to be the only income in my household. <laughs> For now. <laughs> I'm working on Emily to get her job, but it's Okay. <laughs> so, real quick, yes. Can you mention what you what you have in the past about what commandments that we adhere to now that we're in the Old Testament and why? Because all the all the commandments that Jesus had mentioned in the New Testament are those the ones that we we abide to. You know what I'm talking about? You, you yeah. About that yeah. It's, it, there's, uh, I think there's close, there's, there's close to 700, um, yeah, I, it's hard to go through them all, but you have to separate Old Testament Israel, dietary laws were for Israel. We're not under any dietary laws. The only thing that I would say is don't eat anything raw where it still has blood in it. Because life of the flesh is in the blood. So don't be killing a deer and then going out and drinking its blood as some type of ritual. And uh, A lot of people do that. Hunters do that stuff. Uh, I would discourage it. But if you do, you're not going to be stoned to death. That's an Old Testament law. 
Um, it's something that was serious to God, and that's the only thing that I would say. The Ten Commandments, absolutely, you follow them. Um, there's laws of you don't mix seeds while you're planting them. Don't mix this seed with this seed. Um, today, we do multicultural seeding. We, we do all kinds of inbred stuff. Man, there's like watermelon grapes and cotton candy grapes, and man, I love those things. They're infused with, but the Old Testament, you weren't allowed to do any of that stuff. So a lot of those dietary laws, a lot of the um, uh, crop laws, uh, because God wanted you to follow his plan so he could bless you to show everybody else how good it was to follow God. And, and they failed in so many ways. Um, you were not allowed, uh, not to be gross, you were not allowed to poop in the congregation. You, you had to go away. You had to go outside of the camp. If you were on your menstrual cycle, you had to get the heck out of the camp. You could not be in here. And we have people going right into the sanctuary, uh, having their uh, menstrual cycle, and people pooping right outside the doors. Just not like right outside the doors, but in, the, in their own perspective places. So that would have been forbidden in the Old Testament law. So... It's love God, love others. That's how you do that. And so if, if you want to love coming together in a place, then you would give to it um, because it helps spread the gospel. And then if you love spreading the gospel around the world, you'd be generous and give to missions. And then so it just it all boils down to loving God and loving others. And th that's what the Ten Commandments are summed up in. And then you could follow the dietary laws. Just because you're allowed to eat everything doesn't mean that you probably should. Um, so, but yeah, most of that Old Testament stuff is just not, not defined. Now, homosexuality, does God agree with it or not? Okay, Old Testament said they should be stoned to death. Do we do that in the New Testament? Okay, so if you're going to say yeah, we don't stone them in the New Testament, then we don't quote the Old Testament where it talks about homosexuality. You go to the New Testament where it talks about it. Um, and all I'd say is that God's wrath is on them right now, and you see it because of their lifestyle. That's all you say. Plant a seed, give them the gospel, and move on. Because they could have a reprobate mind. And if, if that's the case, then God has given them over to do whatever they want. And America is just about there. We're given over to doing whatever they want. That's a great question. Um, you'd have to look up all the laws of the Old Testament and then weed them out one by one based off of whether it was Israel or does it still apply today. Does the Sabbath apply today? Sure. God gave it for man to have a day of rest. We should have a day of rest. We shouldn't work seven days a week all the time. We should have one day to rest. Could be Wednesday. Absolutely. Doesn't matter what day it is. That's a New Testament thing. Old Testament had to be Saturday because that was the Sabbath. New Testament, it could be a day of rest on Wednesday. Absolutely. You're 100% correct. So, yeah. Jody. So, on the Sabbath, okay, so I know what, I, I believe I know what God is saying, no rest, no work, anything. And in the modern day, today, the Sabbath means, like, no television, no, no cell phone, no, no, no modern thing at all. It's just going to be reading scripture, reading something that's of God. So, it's a little bit different, like, It should be. The Sabbath was waiting for man to have a day of rest because God knew he was going to, that was part of the curse, right? Cursed is the ground and by the sweat of your brow you'll work all the days of your life. But he said, you're going to work six days and you're going to rest one. On that one day was the day we set aside to worship the Lord. That's why in the Old Testament law, it was forbidden to do anything. But now in the New Testament, we're allowed to even work because even Jesus said it. Well, if a, a, a donkey falls in a ditch on the Sabbath, you're going to get him out on the Sabbath. So they were allowed to do work if it was to help people. So is it a, I'm sorry, is it a, are you saying to observe the Sabbath, no matter what day of the week you might choose, is it a commandment or is it a biblical principle? It's a biblical principle, not a commandment. 
So if by chance you don't fulfill it this week or the next week or the week after, it's not an issue. But the principle is there that you need a day of rest to focus on the Lord. What happens when you don't focus on the Lord? You begin to fall away. And it gets easier and easier not to come back. And that's where it comes into church attendance. It's not about church attendance, but it gets easier and easier. It's like going to the gym. Uh, that's hard work, man. And sometimes you don't want to get up and go. But the, the more you stay away, the easier and the easier it is not to go. How about this one? What about alcohol? Allowed or not allowed? What? what? Alcohol. This is an Old Testament principle. Alcohol. Allowed or not allowed? What's moderation? What does the word drunk mean? Too much what? Okay, so that's an English definition. What's the biblical definition of drunk? It's a different Greek word than what we define in our English. Pam. Go a little more in depth than that. Okay, excellent. And that's why Paul in Ephesians 5.18 says, don't be drunk with wine where it's excess, but be filled with the Spirit. It's always about the mind. It's a battle for the mind. Don't let things have control of your mind. And we're out of time, but I won't get into the fact of... Yes. You would need half the food in the grocery store if that was the case. And you'd never go to a fast food joint ever again. No, I'm not allowed. The doctor said. <laughs> yes. Shelly's grandpa was a minister for years. And he lost his sight through diabetes. But the Lord gave him a mind and he could quote scripture inside out. But he used to say he likened tithing. He was a tender on a coal. Yeah. Stop throwing coal, it stopped. He said, liking that to the tide. You want your church to go, it needs that tide. And I always thought that was really Sure. Good. Sure. People want to see growth and people want to see expansion and people want to say, well, guess what? You, you need help to do that. <laughs> and if you don't have the money to do it, it's not going to grow. Uh, that's, a, that's a great ideology. So here's, here's the greatest thing. I used to be a legalist and I used to teach and preach this, that Christians were never to touch alcohol. Shame on me. Hang my head in shame. But here's the ideology. When I went to study the Word of God, the Word of God changed my mind because it says something different than what I was taught. That's why I don't like legalism because it ingrains in your mind. And just like Tom says, you get that ingrained in there and then you see people do things and you go, you're not allowed to do that as a Christian. And you're like, well, if it's not in the Bible, don't come up with legalistic standards for you to say. And the biggest problem that people have is the Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 14 in the, the 20s. And you can go look this up yourself. But in Deuteronomy chapter 14, uh, verse 22 to 27, something of that nature, uh, you'll, have to, you'll have to get it for exact, but I'll close with this. It says that you are to bring your tithes, talking about your tithes. And if the place where I designate is too far for you to go, then you take your tithes, your, your bull offering, your grain offering, and whatever it is, and you sell all of that. And you take your tithe money that was going to go to the temple, and then you do what you want with it. You go buy meat, you go buy wine, and you go buy strong drink, and you enjoy that to the Lord. You can't get around it. Well, wine is grape juice and there was not a... Okay, so let's eliminate that word. There's another one called strong drink. <laughs> it's alcoholic beverage. And God says, bring it and take it and enjoy it. So I'm not going to say that it's okay because that's why it's always talked about from Genesis to Revelation that wine is very addictive and it'll suck you in. Don't get drunk to it. And that's where the biblical context of drunk comes into play. If you want the Greek definition of the word, it's anything that begins to control your mind. And I knew people that were alcoholics like my father. My father was a drunk and an alcoholic and he drank all day long. Drank with his eggs in the morning and he drank till he passed out at night. But there are people that I worked with that would just 
10 o'clock in the morning, thinking about, man, I, gosh, I, I can't wait till I get off of work, man. I got I, I to gotta have something. They were already controlled with alcohol, and they didn't even have one. That's the biblical definition of drunk. Because you go to the Old Testament, it talks about God's arrows were drunk with the blood of the heathen. And in Revelation 19, it talks about the lady that rides the dragon. She was drunk on the blood of the saints. And so it's not talking about actual drinking alcohol. It's talking about what you allow to control you. Democrats are drunk on getting Trump arrested. So it's what controls their whole focus. But like Jeff said, we need to let the Holy Spirit drive us. Not let that. Now, the Bible talks about a weak believer. If you're a weak believer and you have to wear a suit and tie, wear a suit and tie. <laughs> uh, because that's it. Anybody that doesn't know they have liberty, don't do something. <laughs> and and ha- don't go against your conscience. Because that'll hurt the... It's what? Yes. Paul, and that's what he talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. He's like, a meat sacrifice to idols, we know it's not a big deal. Idols are nothing. Idols are nothing to us. We have knowledge. We, it's not a big, but the people that come out of those pagan religions, they know that all that meat was just sacrificed to an idol a minute. How can you eat that? That was sacrificed to an idol. So in order not to offend somebody, you don't do that. And that's why, that's why we don't preach alcohol as acceptable uh, because people that are strong Christians can do it in a context that's biblical and then not tell. Nobody should know that you drink. That's the issue. Everything was done in their own homes. <laughs> so, well, and there's the other problem. <laughs> yes. That's right. Yeah. Don't tell me to work. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, that's yeah, it's a problem and issue, man. But the other way around too. Because yes. Don't let your freedom don't shove your freedom in somebody's face to be a stumbling block to them. Yeah. That's Romans fourteen. Talks all about that. Uh, to the weaker believer that thinks you shouldn't have alcohol, don't ever have alcohol, don't talk about it. To somebody who's a vegetarian, don't talk about the big steak you just went out and had because it might offend them. Or don't invite them to your house and have a bunch of steaks and go, oh, I ain't eating vegetarian crap. Either eat this or get out. Well, that's not appropriate either. And that's what we need to do to not offend another believer. That's not loving them. That's the whole issue. We need to love others. 